All right, gang, here we go. Uh, chem 2, Unit 2, end of Chapter 7, end of the unit. It's a long one. This is probably the longest unit all year as far as the amount of chapters that we're covering. We're just kind of picking and choosing from several different chapters. All right, so here we're going to be talking about metals, nonmetals, metalloids, and just kind of general trends in the periodic table that are fascinating. Okay, uh, so here we've got a periodic table. As we move to the left here, we increase in metallic character. Now, what exactly does that mean? Um, we'll discuss here in just a second just a note here you can see that um, all of these guys they give you kind of like this color chart down here and it's kind of a little bit difficult to see what's going on the nonmetals are like this teal color and they're all over here except for hydrogen is hiding over here in the top left and then the metals are these white colors and then these purple ones are the metalloids all right metals and nonmetals are different things okay metals tend to form cations all right uh, Nonmetals tend to form anions, okay? Uh, but except for hydrogen, hydrogen's a weirdo, and we're going to talk about him. We got a whole slide for hydrogen at the very end of the slideshow here, okay? But uh, so hydrogen uh, forms cations, even though it's a nonmetal, but he can also form anions. And uh, over here, he's got a hydrides, okay? Um, so anyway, so not metals, cations, nonmetals, anions. All right, some properties of metals that you should be aware of. Um, metals are shiny. Okay, so luster is like defined as the shininess. Okay, uh, they conduct heat and electricity. So when we say conduct heat, really what we mean is it's able to move heat uh, from one place to another and doesn't hang on to it. So if you've ever uh, put aluminum foil over your casserole in the oven and then picked it up, and, and the, the you know the aluminum foil loses its heat really really quickly, you can pull it out of the oven. Two seconds later, the aluminum foil you can hold in your hand no problem. However, if you you know did the same thing with like the glass pan that the casserole was in, you touched it two seconds later, you're gonna have quite the burn okay so metals conduct heat very easily they also conduct electricity which is why we use them in wires okay uh, ma they're malleable and ductile okay so malleable means that you can bang them into sheets all right um, and then ductile means that you can turn them into wires okay so the way I remember this is that ductile uh, is like so if you imagine ducks right not quack quack ducks but ducks up in the ceiling okay those kind of ducks um, and if you have quack quack ducks up in your ceiling, you got all sorts of problems. But anyway, so if you've got ducks in the ceiling, they're long, skinny things, much like wires, right? So if they're ductile, you can pull them into a wire. All right, malleable, you're going to mallet them down into a flat sheet or squish them around with your hands. Okay, that's malleable. All right, uh, now solids, are, are they're solids at room temperature, except for mercury. Mercury is the big exception. Uh, and then they have really low ionization energies, and they can form cations very easily. All right, uh, metal compounds. Okay, um, they tend to form ionic compounds because they tend to give up their electrons. Right, ionic compounds are things that don't share their electrons; they give them up relatively easily, and so those are metals. All right, metals give up their electrons, so they form ionic compounds. And the other thing that's interesting is when you have a metal that's mixed with an oxygen. Okay, we call it a metal oxide, and these tend to be basic. All right, and then they react with acids. So they've got this example here. They take uh, nitrogen oxide or nickel oxide, excuse me, nickel oxide here. This is metal oxide because it's a metal nickel mixed with oxygen, so a metal oxide. And then they put a little bit of it in the this nitric acid here, and notice that it reacted and formed this green uh, hydrate or not a hydrate, a green salt. Okay. Um, nickel nitrate right whereas when you put it in water it absolutely does nothing whatsoever because water is not a base it's neutral okay so um or sorry water is not an acid it's neutral the metal it tends to be basic and then it'll react with acids all right non-metals are on the right hand side of the periodic table um and they uh, kind of can appear as solids or gases, and one of them is a liquid at room temperature, and that's bromine. All right, solid and liquids other than that. All right, um, but it just kind of depends on the element, the, kind of one, which way they lean one or the other. Uh, they're dull and brittle, and they don't make good conductors. So here's a little bit of, it looks like sulfur here, and they've hit it with a hammer. Notice that it broke up into little pieces, and so it's very brittle. You can imagine picking up a feel like chalk, okay? Um, and they have a large electron affinity, meaning they're willing to pay a lot of money, pay a lot of energy to get those electrons. So they form anions very easily. Okay, uh, nonmetals. Okay, 
they form molecular compounds when they're bonded with each other. When they bond with metals, they form those ionic compounds we talked about earlier, but when they're just nonmetals, they form molecular compounds. And then most nonmetal oxides are acidic. All right, so that's important to know. So here's a good example here. So this is dry ice, right? Uh, this is so dry ice is carbon monoxide. So this is a this here is a non-metal oxide, right? Because it's carbon, which is non-metal combined with oxygen. So this is a non-metal oxide, and it's acidic. So we put it in this solution uh, with this indicator, and so when it's neutral or basic, it's blue. Okay, and then you put this guy in, and it's going to start making the solution acidic, and so therefore. Uh, it's showing you that carbon monoxide is an acidic compound. All right. So here's a general list. You can pause this and take these down, uh, these down real quick. But it's essentially what we just talked about. All right. Metalloids, okay, have some mixtures of both. Okay. Some of them are good conductors. Some of them aren't. Some of them are shiny. Some of them aren't. Some of them are malleable. Some of them aren't. Okay. Um, and so it's just uh, those couple of metalloids. There's you know four, five, six of them that you know go down that stair step area on our periodic table. Uh, each of them kind of have their own distinct properties. Okay, so this guy here is silicon. Okay, notice that it's shiny. It's a semiconductor. All right, so it's kind of good at conducting, but it's also not kind of good. So this makes it really handy for making computer chips. All right. Now we're gonna. So we talked about properties of metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Now we're just gonna grow. grow go through these uh, groups real quick and just kind of talk about their properties. Most of these you should already be familiar with, okay? And we're going to talk about these. So alkali metals is the first com uh, column in the periodic table. They're soft uh, and they're solids, okay? You can actually cut them with a butter knife fairly easily. I'll, show, you know, I'll bust out a little bit of lithium, a little bit of sodium, and we can play around with that in class a little bit. And um, you can see that it's actually soft and they're actually pretty shiny. Um, but they also react very, very easily with water. So they're hard to find, if not impossible to find, in nature as is. Okay. And then when once we've uh, isolated them, they're stored in the oil. And so this oil is hydrophobic, so it keeps the water away. And so then the uh, sodium, rubidium, and all those guys uh, don't react with or cesium, not rubidium, cesium is, uh, doesn't react with the water and the air or anything else, and it doesn't quite blow up on your face. All right, So they've got normal metallic properties. They're, they conduct fairly well, but they blow up fairly well too, so we don't really like to use them as wires. All right, um, They've got really low densities compared to other metals and really low melting points, and they're really easy to get to melt. But then once they melt, that also means they lose their electrons even easier and they'll blow up even easier. So they get, you know, it's kind of like, you know, how useful is that information at this point kind of thing, but it's still kind of interesting nonetheless. So here's some, yeah, general properties of alkali metals. Notice that they've got uh, low melting points, okay? It's, uh, sodium's melting point is about the same as water, but then as you keep going, their melting point gets lower and lower. So close, the cesium is almost liquid at room temperature. Room temperature is defined at like 25 degrees Celsius, so it's only three degrees off from being liquid at room temperature and joining the exclusive club club that uh, mercury is in all right so alkali metal they wa react with water famously exothermic they shoot off sparks and sometimes they can pop and explode it's a lot of fun we'll do that in class all right um, so differences in alkali metal uh, chemistry okay lithium reacts with oxygen to make an oxide okay lithium oxide here okay but then if you put sodium with oxygen it forms a peroxide okay um, now the big difference here is that uh, you've got your, the, uh, if you look at your charges here, each of these lithiums is a plus one, sorry, one plus, oh my goodness, this is embarrassing, a one plus ion, and each of these oxygens has a two minus charge. All right, and so that's why there's takes two lithiums for every um, one oxygen. But then if you look at this, this is the same idea. We've got two and then one plus, right? So that means this whole thing is a two plus, right, for the sodium, a two plus. But there's two oxygens here, okay, but they can only equal two plus. That means each of these oxygens is only a one minus, okay? Gives you your two minus. So that's what makes it, that's the, whenever you see this peroxide thing here, that means your oxygen, all right, has a charge of uh, one minus so that's where the peroxide comes from here and then when we go farther down uh, potassium rubidium cesium form these superoxide compounds so they'll form these metals will actually bond with make two oxygens bond with it 
And so then each of these oxygens, instead of only having one minus charge, they kind of like have half of a minus charge, one half minus. So there's a, a minus total, and those are called superoxides, and they're super rare. So it's actually kind of interesting that potassium, rubidium, and cesium form those. All right. Um, a one really great test that we have for testing alkali metals is forming uh, different color flames. All right. So when we do the magic show at the end of the year, this could be something that you show, um, and it you know shows pretty easily. Okay. And these are caused by these electronic transitions that we talked about earlier, where they're jumping up and down between um, different values. So lithium makes a characteristic red flame. Sodiums is yellow, and potassiums is purple. All right. And um, yeah. All right, then we get the alkaline earth metals. That's the next column over, all right? They've got higher den uh, densities and melting points than the alkali metals, but their ionization energies are still low, but not quite as low as those of alkali metals, okay? So they're, they're low, meaning they'll give up their electrons, but they're not quite as easy, all right? So um, they'll form plus two cations, losing their outer two most valence electrons pretty easily. So in our reactivity lab, We'll, re you know, we'll see how they react with acid, but they won't react with water, whereas the alkali metals are not the same, okay? Um, so like if it, so as we go down the periodic table here, we'll see that they have generally the same reactivity, but it kind of, as you move down, they kind of become generally more reactive, and that's, um, and that's just because they're getting bigger, and so it's easier for them to lose those outermost electrons, right? Those ionization energy changes, right? Uh, so beryllium does not react with water. Um, neither does magnesium, but you can get magnesium to react with steam. So if you get water super hot, give it a lot of energy, it'll give up its electrons for steam. Um, but then after you go down past magnesium, the rest of the alkaline earth metals will react with water pretty easily, all right? Um, so in general, we see this tra trend almost always across the periodic table. As we go down a group, the reactivity tends to increase. All right. Uh, so here's our um, group 6A. All right. And this is, a, so remember 6A on the periodic table. Let's jump over here to our periodic Oh my goodness, we've been through a lot. All right, so 6A is right here. Notice that on this period here, we're, uh, we're starting in non-metal land, and then we're slowly approaching the semi, uh, the, the metalloids, right? So as we approach the metalloids, we're losing non-metal characteristics and gaining some metal characteristics. So um, as we go down the group for um, these uh, 6A groups here, then um, we kind of end up getting more and more metallic characteristics. So uh, oxygen, sulfur, and selenium are defined as non-metal, so they kind of have their brittle, they don't conduct, okay, so on and so forth. Uh, tellurium, however, is a metalloid, okay, so it's kind of, it's almost like a metal, and then once you get past tellurium, on the other side is polonium, and it's just a straight-up metal, even though it's in the same column as oxygen, all right? Um, oxygen is more likely to form a minus 2 anion, or two minus anion, and but polonium is more likely to have a positive because it's a metal. All right. Um, oxygen also has an interesting characteristic because it can form allotropes. Allotropes is just a fancy way of saying uh, it's a it exists as more than one form. Okay, when it's by itself. So we're all familiar with O2 being oxygen gas. Okay, uh, technically they're oh it's dioxygen, but no one really cares. It's O2. It's oxygen. If you see the term oxygen, you're thinking O2. Okay, and then but we also can get ozone, which is O3. All right, so ozone is an allotrope of oxygen. And other compounds are like carbon is like the quintessential example of something that has allotropes. Right, we know graphite and versus. Um, just like uh, soot or like coal, those are both allotropes of carbon, okay? Um, but anyway, so oxygen, so ozone. Uh, ozone Johnson County uses in their water to help clean it, and ozone breaks down rubber, okay? So that's why uh, once, you know, five, well, man, it was probably like five, seven years ago, something like that, when they started using ozone in the water, uh, plumbing, you know, the plumbing places around here started to get really happy because people are replacing their flanges and their flappers and stuff like that in their toilet more often, and the little gaskets in their sinks because they start to leak because of the ozone eating the rubber, okay? Then we got the halogens, okay? The halogens, same idea. They're the ones right next to oxygen, okay? Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, all those jazz, okay? These guys are non-metals generally, all right? They have very high electron affinities. They're so close to being like a noble gas. They're willing to give up tons and tons and tons of energy to get there, all right? They're really, elect uh, they're very, um, 
reactive. And so this is a, we'll do a lot with halides or, or the halogens in our class, so just because generally they're very reactive, so they're very interesting to do things with. All right. And so they'll react with metals to form metal halides. Okay. And you'll really never find uh, these guys by themselves. All right, in nature. That's why, it, like, in order to have them, we kind of have to separate them out um, and, like, seal them off so they ha don't have anything to react with. Okay. Um, wh because in nature, they're so easy to react and they're so, they have so, such high electro electronegativity or such highly negative electronegativity that they're willing to, or they're able to gain electrons. So, a lot of times in nature, they exist only as anions. All right, the noble gases, very, very high ionization energy and absolutely no electron affinity. Like it's defined as zero, okay? Um, the, that means that they cannot form an anion, meaning because there's zero electron affinity and they have very high, large ionization energy. So it's really, 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 really hard to pull off an electron off a noble gas. And those are the two main reasons why noble gas is unreactive. And you should take note of that because that would make a really good quiz question uh, or exam question coming up. Why are noble gases unreactive? They have really high ionization energy. What does that mean? And then they have really uh, low or even zero electron affinities. All right, um, and they're always found as monatomic gases. Finally, hydrogen is uh, it's got a metallic electron configuration. That's why we put it in the first column of the periodic table, but it's defined as a nonmetal. And really, this is the reason why. Okay, because when it combines and this, you know, this is an acid. And once we get to acids, you'll find out that when we see this, a lot of times we should be thinking about this. But in actuality, that's not really how it exists. It exists as a hydronium polyatomic, H3O+. All right, and that there is a covalent compound. And so that's really the reason why hydrogen uh, is a nonmetal is because it forms covalent compounds, and then um, but it can also form anions. So hydrogen is very special because it's got a metallic uh, electron configuration, but it forms covalent bonds, and uh, it can actually form an anion. So you can actually have two electrons floating around one proton. All right. So that's it of chapter seven. That's it for unit two. We made it, folks. All right. The test is coming up. Make sure you're doing your practice problems. Get lots of help. Review those old quizzes and so on and so forth. Let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you on the flip side.